everyone. I'm John Elledge. Um, I'm the editor of Citymetric.com, which, uh, for those who haven't had the pleasure, is uh, the city's site for the venerable British political magazine, The New Statesman. We're, it's kind of like City Lab, but smaller and more British. Um, so I write about urbanism, I write about transport, I write about climate change. This, the topic of this week's event very much sits at the intersection of, of a lot of our issues. Um, I thought before introducing the panel, I just I just bore on about some some statistics to kind of uh, sum up the nature of the problem here. Three percent of the world's land mass is, is covered in cities, but they contain 55 percent of the population and generate 70 percent of the world's carbon emissions. So, to a very great extent, climate change is an urban problem. Um, it actually gets slightly worse than that. The vast majority of the world's cities are either on coastlines or on rivers quite close to coastlines. And a report last year from the OECD found that there are 17 cities in the world where there are more than 3 million people at risk, at direct risk from sea level rises. Um, most of the cities in greatest danger are in East and Southeast Asia. We're talking about places like Mumbai, Dhaka, Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, in each of those, there's more than six million people at risk. But one of the ones that you'd think would sum up the problem, but yet we somehow don't talk about it very much, is, is Miami. In the greater Miami region, there are five million people at risk of, of sea, catastrophic sea level rises. They've got the Atlantic in front of them, they've got swamp behind them, and the whole place sits on limestone. So in the event of the sea level rising, the water is going to come at that city from literally every direction. In 2015... The state of Florida banned its Department for Environmental Protection from using the phrase climate change. In 2016, the state of Florida voted for Donald Trump. And in 2017, Trump pulled the US out of the Paris Agreement on climate change. So, you know, the state of Florida is effectively voting to kill its biggest city there. You will notice I'm not doing my bit for the environment. I've not gone paper free. Um, but the good stuff is if 70% of the world's emissions are coming from cities, that means that cities can, in theory, stop 70% of the world's emissions. So we're starting to see coalitions of cities and municipal governments working together to do the stuff that national governments haven't got the nerves to do. Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with a book called uh, If Mayors Ruled the World by a, a political theorist called Benjamin Barber, who sadly died earlier this year. But that book argues that nation states are going to be unable to, to solve the world's problems because the dynamic is inherently competitive. Uh, you know, I'm speaking as a very pro-European member of the, the, the British public, so I kind of feel that one quite closely right now. Um, but cities don't suffer from, from this problem. Cities cooperate. Cities can share ideas. Cities can work together to solve problems. So we're starting to see organizations like the, the C40 Coalition, or, or in June this year, the former New York mayor, Michael Bloomberg, announced that he brought together a group of mayors, governors, universities, and businesses, which were hoping to plug the gap that the US's departure from the Paris Agreement will leave. He said, we're going to do everything America would have done if it had stayed committed. You know, so maybe, maybe Barbara was onto something. Maybe cities really can save the world here. Um, as to what they can do, that's kind of where we run up against the limit of my knowledge. So I'm going to turn to the panel and start asking them questions about this now. So if everyone could join me on stage, that would be good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce them one by one and give a very brief description of who they are, but then very much let them kind of tell us a little bit about their work um, before we kind of move on to the debate section. So if we could start on this side with um, Amandine Kramp. Uh, apologies, I haven't asked how to pronounce your surname, so I'm going to, I'm going to do this terribly badly. But Am Am Amandine Kramp, who, um, from, from Adi who's an engineer and town planner from Adim. So if you could... Uh, Give us a little bit of an insight into what you do. Um, oh, it's, it's loud. Um, yes, um, so I'm Amandin. I am an engineer and urban planner. Um, I'm working for ADEM. ADEM is a French agency of 
environment and uh, energy man management. It's a public agency uh, under the joint authority of the Ministry of um, Ecological and Solidary uh, Transition and the Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation. HADEM aims to accompany the necessary ecological transition by offering funds, tools, and expertise to territories, businesses, and citizens. So um, I'm here to, to, to talk with you about transition and why for us it's so important to, to put everything we add to transition and transitioning cities. Thank you. Next up we have John Mark Simon from Zero Waste Europe. Yes, good afternoon. Um, so, Zero Waste Europe is a network of, um, of civil society organizations. There are 30, we have 30 groups in, in 22 European countries. We're part of a, of a global network called Gaia, which brings together civil society groups, um, like working for a more sustainable waste management and towards zero waste. Um, I would say uh, what, what we do in, in Europe that is probably most relevant for this discussion is we have a network of, uh, of uh, zero waste cities around Europe. And I think that the most like, like, uh, interesting feature of that, that this is the kind of a bottom-up approach. So it's been like civil society organizations that have actually put pressure on cities, on municipalities, to go for zero waste. So this is not the mayors getting together, it's actually civil society pushing the mayors, pushing the, the municipalities to, to work together. And in that sense, while well, we work on doing advocacy in Brussels, we work promoting uh, zero waste lifestyle and, um, and, yeah, and redesigning products in a way that they don't become waste. But that, that's it for now. Thank you. Next up, it's Beretti Chadvedi, who's founder and director of the Chintan Environmental and Research Action Group. So, hi. Um, is this working even? Yes. So, um, I work with, um, me and my colleagues, we work with uh, the idea of environmental justice and the way it can actually take place in cities of India, which are neither very, um, very, um, they're in the middle, they're not very developed and they're not very underdeveloped, but what we, the way we look at it, we work around the issues of consumption and waste, but our understanding is that if you are not going to be inclusive of the poor, particularly people who are picking up the trash, and that is a phenomenon not only for India, but even for, even for France actually, and if you're not going to include them, if you're not going to give them the right to belong to the city in many, many different ways, in the ways that they see it, then you don't have justice. And that is the work. So we're saying you cannot, be, you cannot become a greener city without being a city that's inclusive. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Fanny Kerry Kant, who's Director of Cooperation at Enacoop. Hi, I'm very glad to be here with you all. I'm Fanny Caricont and I work for Enercop. Uh, Enercop is a French green electricity supplier and we have three main specificities. Uh, the first one is that we sell 100% renewable energy and we buy it from local producers through direct contracts. We don't buy it on the market, we buy it to local producers. Our second specificity is that we are a cooperative, which means that we have a specific business model. We are a non-for-profit organization and a specific democratic model with a particular governance. And the third specificity is that we are a network of local cooperatives uh, working all together. Uh, and so we have a very local approach uh, and we develop links between citizens, consumers, producers, uh, in order to improve the transition in the territory. And I will explain how we work with cities in order to develop the ecological transition. Thank you. I think the, the first question I kind of want to discuss, um, I, I kind of gave my own little sort of feelings on it in my, in my sort of introductory ramble there, but we're here talking about cities as opposed to other ways of kind of tackling this project. And I'm just wondering, what's the, what's the argument for, for, for addressing issues of, of you know, waste and resource and so on at city level as opposed to nationally or internationally? Amadine, you're a, you're a town planner by trade. Maybe you could kind of give us your, your thoughts on this one. Um, 
I, I think it's like you introduced the session, like um, most of the population in the world is going to live in a urban area. So um, we, we need to, to organize. Uh, we need to choose to organize and to choose to, 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 to transition because um, right now, um, I don't know, I, I'm not sure that we choose. I, I, I'm sure that we are at the mercy of crisis of our current environment because um, we react, we react. And for me, it's really important to choose and to organize and to plan um, the organization of the city and to organize how we can uh, collect waste, how we can um, provide water, energy, and with the most sustainable, sustainable uh, way to do that. Does, does this ring true with you? Um, I think that it also follows the tendency that we're seeing of uh, decentralization, of power, of decision making, of structures, of uh, many things. Um, I think that over the last decade, what we have seen is that the, the tendency was maybe to globalize production, that people would live outside the city. So actually, that we are we have compartmentalized life, and I think that what we have to go back to is actually the cities are a place where you can work, you can live, and you should also manage your resources locally, and you, if possible, produce your energy locally, and close the loop. And um, and from that perspective, I think cities are becoming more and more relevant. Of course, the national level and in Europe, the European level play a very important role because they set the guidelines, they set the objectives, etc. But implementation at the end of the day is, in the, is at the local level. And it's also at the local level where actually civil society can interact in a, in a, in a best way with the policy makers because Brussels is far, Paris is far, but, but um, beyond the capitals, I think local level is very important. So from that perspective, and also my experience, I mean, over the last years, I've, we've been working at the European level, national level, and local level. The real change is clearly happening at the local level. Um, Barati, where do you stand on? Do you think cities are the right level to be working on these problems? In of course, experience? cities are the right level, but um, I also want to say, if you're going to look at waste, cities have to consume less. And uh, cities have to consume a less of everything because cities are the ultimate site of consumption. You're pulling in not just rural resources. You're the you're the audiences for a lot of a uh, lot of products. So I mean, do we really need all the shoes we have, kind of thing? And I'm not talking just of individuals. I think uh, as a community, we have to be supportive and be less ashamed if we just um, if we don't kind of consume the amount that is considered. I think it's very politically important to flag who is it who should consume less and who should consume more because across the world you have people who actually need to consume much more in our cities. I mean, there's, there's people like homeless people um, who actually require more, more clothing and more of everything. And I think I'd just like to flag it there. I mean, is this a, a north-south thing, do you think? Is that, is that no, not at all. I was, I've spent some time with the Buffins of Paris, um, who are the guys who pick up the trash. There are about 6,000 of them here, and I've been spending time and getting to know them more and be working more on these issues. I was completely... Um, did I switch it off by mistake? No. Okay. So I was completely shocked because I thought they were so politically disenfranchised. I mean, they're, they're like invisible people. But they're, and they're struggling to say, don't burn the waste, uh, let us recycle it. Because obviously they don't want, if you burn the waste, it's toxic for everybody. And it's a lousy way to handle waste anyway. But you're not, but if they got the waste and they were allowed to be treated as citizens and hold their own markets, then they would be allowed to participate in the city of Paris. So I think that is, that is the kind of complexity you can see across a lot of cities. Family, you, work, you guys work very closely with a number of cities. What's, what's the argument for doing that? Surely you get to scale quicker if you could work with national governments instead. Why work locally? Yeah. First, uh, I would like to say that for me, it's not a good thing to make an opposition between the levels. Uh, we need all the levels uh, to act and to be responsible, and we need to go on putting pressure 
on all the representatives at a global, European, national, local levels. Uh, so we don't have to resignate, uh, to abdicate uh, on this point of view. Uh, but it is true that the cities uh, can play a very special part uh, on the fight against uh, climate change and developing the transition. And I think this can be explained by two reasons. Maybe the first reason is that uh, the cities have a greater proximity with citizens, so maybe they are easier to move and easier to understand the problems the citizens have uh, in their quotidian life. And the second thing is that I think the cities have very well understood that the and a transition is not only an environmental issue, but a global issue uh, with social consequences, with economic consequences. And so they, I think they can't see the holistic approach of transition. Uh, and that's why for me, it's a very important level. And with NRCOP, we have a lot of cooperation with cities uh, in order to, to, to develop the transition and the production of renewable energy. There's, I think there's always a danger of conversations like this that you kind of get stuck on theory. So let's let's kind of drill down and really talk about what it is that cities can and are doing and, and that other cities might want to cop, copy. Amandine, you have a couple of examples that you think were, were worth exploring more, I believe. Yes. Um, maybe um, if, if, we, if we talk about climate, I can take the example of New York. Um, before to... 2005. I don't think New York was knows like a, a green city in ecological transition. It, it was known for building everywhere to try to uh, to to urbanize um, on on the sea, uh, like like Dubai, and um, the, the the first uh, thing was economic. Uh, after 2005, um, there is a huge crisis. Um, I don't know, maybe you remember, but it was Hurricane Sandy. And Hurricane Sandy um, um, provoked uh, so um, disastrous damage to New York. Uh, thousands of houses, of cars uh, disappeared. Uh, it was like, um, I think, uh, 19 billion of dollars of damages. It's, it's really big. It's really big. How can you imagine what you can, we can do with 19 milliards, uh, billions? So um, they decide to, to change uh, everything. They decide to think about how they, they, they need or they have to, to uh, think the urbanization and the planning of the city. And it's now they they are like they are now the first city to put resilience uh, uh, in every uh, program in, in every uh, politics. Uh, they hire uh, people to work only in resilience. So uh, I think New York is a good example for that. And um, a second one is um, uh, it was an American uh, example. So um, an European one. It's Copenhagen. Copenhagen want to be the first city in the world to be completely decarbonated um, in 2025, something like that. And I think um, everybody uh, uh, thinks that Copenhagen is um, um, is a is a ecological city because they want to do that and because it's cultural to 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 go by bicycle every day and. Uh, um, the, in the beginning, it was not that. It was a very poor city uh, with um, uh, not a lot of migration because everybody wants to, to live in the metropolitan area. And uh, with the oil crisis uh, in '76, um, uh, I think, uh, the, the population was so poor that they have to... Um, to, to let the car, to, to sell the car, because it was too expensive to, to move. And uh, they took bicycle. And the, the, the towns um, decide to create the first uh, bicycle line. And now uh, they understand that it's a necessity uh, to, be, to, be, to be green, and they really want to be the first decarbon 
affected city and to help to climate change. They, they think that they have an action in local uh, to, 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 be, to, to act in global situation of climate change. What I find interesting about both those examples is that both of them are, are, are change as a result of some form of crisis. So in Copenhagen, it was economic crisis. In New York, it was much more a, a physical crisis. And I remember from the time, there were like genuinely quite frightening pictures of like you know subway tunnels entirely yeah. flooded with water. And it's just like, it's a vision of, of the future if we don't solve this problem. But we hope that most cities do not have to face that kind of crisis before before taking these measures. So how do you how do you get people on board? Do you think? Um, it, it's it's my everyday <laughs> to to try to get people on board. Um, how we can do that? We have to to help um, to help uh, uh, the government, the local government, to 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 take consideration of the situation. Um, the, the next crisis, everybody says that it's a climate crisis and uh, the, the climate change refugees with the migration and how we can try to, to, to uh, anticipate, to, uh, to react and not, uh, and not to be at the misery of the situation. Um, Yes, uh, it was yesterday. Yes, yesterday, uh, Nicolas Hulot, uh, the, the French ministry, announced uh, uh, what we call a uh, plan climat. Uh, it's a uh, English climate plan, I think so. And um, they take decision to uh, in 2030 to uh, to to change everything: energy, um, the sustainable energy, mobility, uh, everything to. To, to anticipate the, the future crisis because in 30 years it, it's going to be too late, too late to act. We need to act now. And how we can do that is it's help with, like I said in the beginning, with tools. We, we provide tools, we provide funds, a lot of funds. Um, Pascal confirmed before, say, uh, we, 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 we try to, to help a lot of organizations to create new platform to create new project and uh, and citizen it's really important to uh, to change the comportment of citizen and for that we need education we need ecological environment solidarity education every day every day in the small acts like have a, have a recyclable uh, glass glasses or every day Jean-Marc, perhaps I could ask you, I mean, how are you finding the appetite for getting ahead of the game on this one and making changes before, it is, before circumstances force you to act? Yeah, that's a good point, really. How do you, how do you trigger this transition? Because from a zero-waste perspective, what we're seeing is that, uh, well, waste is something that's very visible, so it's relatively easy to act when you see the problem on your face. And having a waste crisis is a very is a way to see that actually you need to change things. With climate change, it has the problem of, of course, talking about something that is not there yet. Um, I can talk a bit about the examples from, from our network. Um, the, and I think that as important as, as the, the picture of, of a success, like for example, I can explain a, a small town in Italy, Capannori was the first town in Europe to adopt the Zero Waste Challenge. And all of that started because a primary school teacher got together with the parents of the, the pupils to stand against the construction of an incinerator that was going to be built next to the primary school. Um, they stopped that, but they went beyond that. They organized separate collection. They organized reuse centers. They organized uh, several mechanisms that created local jobs, saved money, stopped the incinerator, and started kind of a, a movement in Europe. What I think is interesting here, more than the picture, is really how do you actually like make this transition happen? Because without the incinerator, maybe we will not be where we are now. So um, from bad things, good things sometimes come. One might say, um, the, the, what we are doing in our network is to have civil society actually engage with municipalities and decide on a path together towards the future. I think the important thing is to devise this transition not for the citizens, but with the citizens, so that through this, um, at, 
uh, five, ten years' time, you can have goals for changing consumption patterns, for having, um, well, there can be many practices to reduce uh, f uh, food waste, to reduce packaging waste, etc. Um, and just to conclude, I mean, we're talking a lot about climate change, but I think one of the big crises that, that, that is coming, and we're going to see more and more, is, is the crisis caused by plastic pollution that is a bit everywhere. And it's something that, different to climate change, is something that citizens are encountering everywhere. Plastic is everywhere. And it has some good applications, but for most of the single-use applications, actually, is superfluous. It could be easily replaceable. Alternatives exist. And I think that we're going to see people organizing around that, and actually going to the to this city authorities and asking them for concrete measures to stop that. So you see like from a concrete action at the local level, municipalities get active and then you start changing actually production patterns that can influence as much as like, I don't know, the oil companies, for example, producing the raw material for plastic. So just as an example. Barati, do you, where are you seeing the pressure coming from? Is it coming from the city level or from the, the community level below that? Well, there are a bunch of pressures. Um, I can talk about India, and it's interesting because there are pressures largely from um, elite, extremely elite citizens who are either organizing, and in most cases, what's very interesting is that they're organizing and going to court because we have a green tribunal as well. And uh, they're going to the city courts, they're going to the green tribunal, and a lot of them are asking for very urban kinds of changes. So, uh, but there are groups like ours where we're actually organizing both citizens as well as, um, uh, you know, elite citizens, but also 12,000 uh, poor workers who work in trash. That's what we've organized. And what we are doing is organizing them and making them shift their perspective so that then they do a certain kind of demand. Now, they don't go to court, but what they do is they'll just march somewhere. I mean, imagine 1,500 people just marching and going up to the chief minister and creating political pressure. And I think uh, what we're really seeing in India is the, is, the, um, is the elite coming together. I think what we're doing also is interesting things. For example, what we are doing is we've used IT and we've created something called uh, Pick My Trash. So you can download our app and you can ask us to come and pick any of your recyclable wastes. But we're not going to pay you because in, these things are commodities and normally people go and pay them. We're saying we're not paying you because it's a political transaction. You need to give this to the person who's collecting it, who is in pa a waste picker, and that is their livelihood. So in that sense, even though you live now, most Indians in larger cities increasingly have, uh, you know, live in gated communities or they have made their communities gated. So we'll say you don't deal with a lot of these people anymore, but you you need to have that transi transition. And that kind of also has resulted in another pressure point, which is give us these services. We're finding a lot of ordinary citizens saying, we want to conserve our vendors. We want to conserve and look after these people. We don't want police to keep beating them up and you know, uh, making them pay illegal gratification amounts. So that's a third kind of pressure. Communities. Um, looking after old service providers who've been there for years and years because they already have. So I really see these three things. And what I like a lot is how we use IT because we use things like WhatsApp, we use Facebook, we're using uh, videos and putting them up and using all of that to build the case, whether it's to go to court or whether it's um, recently a group of citizens shamed the Delhi government for cutting 6,000 trees uh, not 6,000, they were going to cut all of those, and they completely shamed them and started a petition, 20,000 people signed, and the minister was so humiliated. And similarly, uh, but we did that because the weekend before, the biggest um, company, the, te the teleprovider company, cut down secretly and illegally 6,000 trees in one of the most ancient forests in the world. So we knew that that was gone, but we needed to fight. And it was just some really ordinary person who just got angry. So that's the kind of change. Finally, you're obviously in the, the renewable energy sector. Like, where are you finding, where, where is the appetite for switching to renewables coming from? Is that coming from government or is that coming from the people the government work for and they're just responding to that? 
I think today it comes from different point of view and different groups. Uh, we can see that citizens uh, are more and more organizing themselves uh, in the territories in order to develop um, renewable production projects owned by the citizens themselves and also with some local communities, local cities. So that's a way of uh, making things change. Uh, but we also see that uh, the politicians uh, and some elected persons in the city councils uh, have understood that it is in their interest to demonstrate that their cities do and act very strongly uh, in order to, to make the transition. And to, to take the example of the energy sector, uh, I need to explain you that, uh, that in France, uh, since the electric market was open, the people and the cities, they can choose the uh, electricity supplier they want, electricity supplier they want. Uh, and uh, we can see more and more cities. I'm going to take an example. Uh, it is the metropolitan area of Nantes. Uh, it's a city in the west of France. Uh, and they decided to choose Enercop, the green uh, renewable energy supplier, as an electricity supplier for about 16 public buildings uh, which belong to the metropolitan area, like schools, libraries, nurseries, etc. Uh, they did that because it's a way for them to uh, develop the renewable energies. Uh, it's also a way for them to get uh, profits because we are a non-profit uh, organization and the profits we have, uh, we get are reinvested in local projects of renewable energy. And so choosing a supplier like Enercop is a way for the municipalities, for the communities, for the cities to demonstrate to their citizens that they are very aware of their responsibility in the fight against climate change so they can highlight their actions towards the citizens uh, and it's very use useful for the cities and for the people and for the citizens. Something I feel we should probably sort of try and spell out a little bit is what does a sustainable city actually look like and how does it differ from the, the model we're perhaps, we're perhaps more used to? Um, I've kind of been going forever on a very predictable order, but does anyone want to dive in on, on that one with their vision of a sustainable city? Oh, please do. I think a sustainable city is one where, where on one hand... Um, there's a very concerted effort with results to actually reduce your, your footprint um, of consumption. But on the other hand, where very clearly different kinds of populations, socioeconomic populations, um, are consuming in ways where the gap is not particularly large. At least there has to be a basic assets that everybody has to own, whether it's clean air or proper housing or whatever. So I think there's fundamentally, I, I don't like to, I wouldn't even say a basic income. In fact, one of my co-housemates and I were talking about it. I would say a basic assets that we can all access. And there, there really has to be no other, and there has to be a cap equally on top, how much you can access. Otherwise, there's no way to be sustainable. Amadine, perhaps you'd like to give us your vision of a sustainable city. Yeah, yes, I, I agree uh, completely uh, with that. And I, I just want to say, we, I, I don't like when, when we talk about uh, models of sustainable city. There is no models. There is multiples of sustainable city because it's with culture and it's uh, with uh, the environment where is a city. There is small and big and there is so many ways to be sustainable. So... Um, we have to be careful because it's it's uh, a big mistake we did in France. Like we create uh, models of city um, and we copy them and paste it everywhere, and we have the same city everywhere. So it's not working because we have we don't have the same people everywhere. We don't have the same environment everywhere. So we need to have specific cities. Um, uh, oof they fit uh, the, the, the citizen and, um, and yes the basic assets for inclusive city for everybody is it's really important and for the health of everybody and we we we, didn't, we don't have uh, we don't talk about um, urban uh, farming and uh, urban alimentation it's a really 
um, big issues now to, to provide uh, food to the city and uh, I think it's something we have to put in, in, the, in the basis of our set. Finally. Um, I, I agree with what uh, Amandine has just said, but uh, I just would like to say that in my opinion, there are a few criteria that can define what would be an ideal sustainable city. Uh, and as these criteria, I would mention the democratic approach. Uh, first, I want to say that to become a real sustainable city, for me, it's essential to involve the, the citizens and to create the conditions uh, for the citizens to be really part and actors of the transition. Uh, for me, the second criteria would be to say that the transition is really an holistic approach, a global approach, and we have to deal with the uh, energetic issue, but also the social issue, uh, the alimentation issue, the mobility issue, the education issue. Uh, all those things are completely linked, and I think it's very important to, to, to put them also all together. Uh, and the third criteria I would like to mention uh, is what Barati said. For me, it's very important to understand that the transition uh, mustn't be a topic of rich people. Uh, and we have to develop um, public programs. Uh, I think that's a responsibility of the, local author of the public authorities uh, in order uh, to make all the people inclusive uh, in the transition. And more often, we can forget this kind of thing. Uh, all the people are not equal uh, in front of the transition, and we really need to help the most vulnerable people uh, if we want to create a real transition for everyone. Uh, I'm, in a second, I'm going to go to the audience for questions, but it would be terribly unfair for me not to ask John Mark for his vision before we do. Well, much of it has been said, but I think the concept of resilience is very important. And it's not only material and energy resilience, it's also social resilience. And in a way, I think that the only thing I would add is the concept of actually shortening uh, supply chains. Right? Today, the, the supply chains are think are too long, and that's having many externalities in the form of emissions, of packaging, of uh, like not visualizing actually externalities of our consumption, etc. And actually shortening the supply chains, like going back to like local production, decentralization of uh, of many things. Uh, I think it's it's key. Okay. Well, there is a microphone. It's now your turn. Who has a question for the panel? Come on, there must be someone. Don't make me pick on. I will pick on. I will pick on someone. All right, All right. Excellent chat there. <laughs> Hello, my name is Maximilian, and I'm uh, here because I'm personally very interested in this subject. But I happen to be also a member of a city council of a small town in the south of France, and uh, so what always. Uh, what I, I have as a question when I see all these cities like organizing in the C40, like Paris and all the big cities, and uh, the, the, because you mentioned it just in your introduction um, about the gap that is evident between the big cities of the world, the, like the world cities, and the periphery, and it's uh, you, you mentioned the Brexit, and I mean it's a, it's a terrible. Uh, symbol of this gap between the big cities and the periphery that is behaving differently or voting differently. So I'm very glad that there's someone coming from these, like uh, Bharati, from the from the point of view of the smaller peripheral places. It's, it, I think it's a very, okay. but it's well to me it's a it's a it's a very big question how we can like make it that the smaller places are not like uh, f feeling so much apart and this gap between the cities and the big cities and the small cities and the periphery has to needs to be somehow cl closed there's also um, a second issue that's constantly in my my own mind personally in this debate because I'm British is that our cities are incredibly weak organizations. They don't have any financial powers. They have very limited levers they can pull uh, because it's a very, England in particular is a very, very centralized state. Um, so it is quite difficult bringing people along in, in parts of it, but I suspect that's just Britain being weird. Um, 
how can they turn that into a question? What's the question really? How can we how can we make sure we're not just talking about? I mean, we're here in Paris. How can we make sure we're not just talking about the sort of big world cities? And, and to what extent is is that a problem? Do we think? Perhaps talk to us. Well, um, I mean, I guess uh, I guess that's that depends on what voices are represented here. I wanted to clarify that the city I come from is one of the biggest in the world. It's Delhi. You know, but uh, but I understand where you're coming from, um, and appreciate that. Um, I think part of it is voices. Part of it is that there's so much money that just goes into um, goes into uh, you know centering a lot of projects into larger cities. You see that everywhere, and in the in cases where that doesn't happen, you see a kind of blossoming forth because you do need some kind of uh, an anchor for a city to kind of reinvent itself. And get another kind of voice. So, Gurgaon, which is in our periphery, was didn't exist. It was just an agricultural place that got urbanized, and then suddenly there were schools, and it really had the best education, and people started moving there. And now you do have they're so much more strong than the city of Delhi, though they're about one fifth our population or less. So, I think um, I think part of it is. Very carefully advocating to invest in other parts, but equally, I think let's hear what those people have to say. A lot of people don't like it. Uh, a lot of people don't want colonization of their culture. So I think that's a tricky one, and it's a local one. I'm, I'm actually going to play devil's advocate slightly here, and say I kind of suspect that if New York and London and Paris all moved in a certain direction, a lot of other cities around the world would want to move in that direction too. Just because some of the world cities had, so like, I mean, is it is it really a problem if we kind of exclude small cities from this debate? Because are they just going to copy the the big guys, big guys culturally rather than physically necessarily? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, which cities? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think sometimes there is a feeling of inferiority uh, in small city. Uh, because they, they think there is no resources or there is there is no value in, in these territories, and um, it, 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 it's wrong because um, the, the the value is people, it's citizen, and you can say, oh, um, I'm not Paris, I'm not London, so I can do the same. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can, but with a, a, a small uh, scale and with. Uh, Small resources, but just to to aim uh, what you need for this small city. And um, a very important thing to do is partnership. You can be a partner to a big city. You 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 can be a partner of a big uh, group of a big something. What you want to, to for going want where we want to go. So um, uh, small city. Um, are not uh, in inferiority. They are, there, is, there, is more, there is more small cities than big cities. So if you put every small city together, it's, it's a, 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 bigger, a, a biggest um, strong. So um, you really need to, to, uh, to do partnership, I think. And uh, there is, um, for Adam, for, for my, my corporation, um, we try to to put in the in the light small city because there is so many ideas better than in big city because there is they can do more with less and it's really important to try to do more with less and not to want to be like Paris because you are not. Also, presumably there are a lot of ideas. It's easier to roll out in a small city. It'd be quite difficult to do. I don't know, a new big transport scheme Paris-wide, but you could do some things in the old where it's much, much smaller. Exactly, and that's the point I wanted to raise because um, when you try to design, for example, a zero waste program or a separate collection scheme, uh, Paris, London, New York, etc., are big, they get uh, titles in the newspapers, but try to roll out a separate collection scheme in Paris or New York. Good luck. I mean, our experience is that you need to start small with these things. So actually, normally our pilot projects start with 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, and then you roll out. Now we have like really like City of Milan, for example, has rolled out 
separate collection of organics, but that came after 20 years of working with small and medium-sized cities. So actually, it's, it's a gradual step. And as I see the big cities as a kind of, because everybody in the world knows what Paris is or London is, but not too many people know about the small cities or the pilot projects. But that's where things start. If you can make it small, then a big city is just the addition of small units. So from a technical perspective, start small and then grow big. Yeah, ju ju just to um, add one thing on, on this topic. Um, I think, yes, it's true that whatever your tool is, uh, you can act for the transition. And we have a lot of examples of little town villages uh, which are developing projects uh, in order to improve the transition. Uh, with Enercop, we have partnerships with uh, uh, little cities uh, which develop um, renewable production projects or economic savings, uh, energetic um, saving programs. Uh, but we need to say that it's easier when you are rich and big. Uh, that's the truth. So uh, I think uh, we have to both uh, help the little uh, towns and villages uh, to develop projects, but we also have to remember uh, every, everyone and the big cities and the public authorities that there is a responsibility we have uh, to develop um, the notion of uh, solidarity, of uh, what we call financial perequation. I don't know if it is a good word in English, uh, but uh, the question of uh, um, uh, creating this solidarity between all the cities, uh, the poor ones, the big ones, the rich ones, uh, is also a democratic question. So we need to go on uh, putting pressure on all the public authorities uh, in order to develop this uh, kind of solidarity and, of course, the financial aspect of this solidarity. Barata, you wanted to add something very briefly. Yeah, I wanted to add, while we're talking of big and small city, is that I don't want us to kind of forget the kind of human, human pleasures of a big city, in the sense that many, many of us or many of our parents or grandparents have migrated not only for jobs, which is the big deal in a big city. There are certain kinds of jobs, such as a dancer or an artist, you really can't follow in a small town but also for many people, the idea of identity. I mean, you, um, you, it's very difficult for a lot of women in uh, rural parts of South Asia to actually um, really live the kinds of lives and feel productive and actualize themselves because there's no way that there is a kind of space where they can actually dress up the way I'm dressed up and go to work. It's not happening. Those spaces don't exist and the society is so... Um, won't allow you to do that. And we're finding that cities are extremely liberating from notions of gender and even caste in, in India, but many, many other kinds of things. So I think we should remember that there, there are certain important things for many of us from, uh, from what you might call the developing South. We escape the tyranny of the small town by becoming a little more anonymous and making our kind of uh, lives in cities. Are there any further questions from, from the floor? Yep, there's someone up there, up the stairs. Excellent. There's a microphone working its way towards you. Hi. Um, my name is Carol. I come from Lebanon, uh, Beirut, which is relatively a very, very small city. I have a, a question and a, a thought. The first question is, uh, can we really talk about sustainability in cities that have political instability? And the, th the other thought is um, when we talk about transitioning in cities, even if we build like a big transport system or whatnot, maybe it's not really needed in small cities because you can move around. And this idea of being anonymous uh, is liberating as well, but it doesn't really change the fact that culturally in that area, geographically speaking, there is a certain culture imposed. So I'm wondering how, from your experience, expanding cities or making them, transitioning them into something that is more developmentally similar to Paris or New York, which for me has a very terrible subway system, for example, um, how is that really useful for small cities? And how does that help people in a way? Okay, so I think there are really, there are two questions there, aren't there? One is like, should, should, should developing cities also be learning from, from the failure of those that have gone before? Uh, but the first part is, you know, how do you get people to talk about this stuff 
in, in times of political instability, which, yes, I think that's a pretty good question. How do you get people to focus on, on this kind of long-term thinking when there are rather more pressing issues? Um, Jean-Marc, you're dealing with some of these things. Not, not the situation in the Middle East, but in terms of getting people to focus on, on longer-term thinking. Well, the thing is, and uh, in, in the past, cities were sustainable and they were not planned, mostly, right? So people kind of like get organized. I think that when there is political instability, kind of this kind of disruption of of what used to be the status quo. It can be that they were coming from a from a sustainable or completely unsustainable situation. I mean, of course, when the political instability is chronic, like is happening in some places in the world, of course, that is that is an issue that we need to address. Then there are different levels of political instability. For example, we have worked with the city of Naples precisely after the, the, the waste crisis, which I know is also happening in Lebanon. And it was difficult. It was difficult. We had to organize, um, well, it, it got to a point that the people collecting the waste were being shot in the streets by the mafia. So, I mean, it was, it was difficult. It was politically unstable. Um, so I, I don't really have an answer, but uh, but I think that a, having a civil society that is persistent in the long run, if things stabilize or get to some kind of a um, stabilization, uh, things can start moving. So right now, for example, in Naples, at least that is solved. There are some parts of Naples that are working fairly well, some others not. And of course, uh, getting out of political instability is something that takes a bit of time. Um, my only uh, advice on these situations, though, that is something I've seen, for example, in the city of Cairo and others, is that um, we tend to look for silver bullets, normally coming from developed countries or global north, however you want to call it, that will land there with a multinational and will try to say, I'm going to fix a problem with you, I'm going to build a big infrastructure, and like that you can live with that in an unstable political situation. That normally has not worked. So I think um, I don't have an answer. But I, I think we have the examples of things that have not worked. So I think it's a, like the systemic approach is, is important, but I admit it's, it's really challenging in political instability. Yeah. We've, we've talked about things that cities would want to copy. We've talked about good practice. In some ways, it's much more fun to talk about when cities have got things terribly, terribly wrong and everyone can point and laugh at them. So, you know, what... Would anyone like to sort of name an example of, of a city they think is an absolutely terrible example that other cities should be avoiding at all costs? Um, we, we, we have many examples um, in Qatari, uh, not Dubai, but um, close to Dubai, there is many cities. They, they, they want, it's a marketing city, like, the, the most green city in the world. It is in a desert, uh, and they they put water for golf, uh, and they say yes, it's green. Yes, it's green because it's a color green, and uh, but it, it it's not it's not. And there is so many funds invest in this city. I, I'm sorry because I I, I don't remember the name, um, but but. but uh, it, it, it's it's marketing. So we as there is so many marketing cities, um, we we need to try to 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 put real technology, if you want technology, or real democracy, of real social improvement uh, to have sustainable city. But um, we we can take um, example. Um, um, it, it's like um, the smart city. The smart city is uh, the, the new thing. It's uh, the hot topic. Uh, but is it really sustainable? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It can help to be sustainable, but it's not. And uh, for example, um, in, in Korea, uh, you have a city. They said they are the, like uh, in Qatari, like the most green city in the world and the, the biggest small city, but it's just technology and it's it's not resolving every issue, it's just technology and security technology and it, it's um, camera everywhere, it's uh, reporting everywhere, everything is data and I, I think it's 
not uh, great. It's it's uh, not a good example of what we want to go uh, for sustainable cities. Has anyone else got any examples of bad practice? Barati, please. Um, I just come back to the city of Gurgaon, which is not very old, and it had the benefit of uh, originally being an agricultural city, and then one of the biggest real estate developers acquired chunks of it. And this was not very long ago. I mean, it's 20 years. So it had the benefit of a lot of technology as well as a lot of knowledge at that point. But they, they built homes and massive offices. And a lot of these, actually, they forgot to build sewage systems. And that's just the beginning. They also forgot about the trash. So uh, when it became a municipality, they were busy dumping trash in what I told you earlier was a, is one of the oldest forests in the world. It's much older than the Himalayas. But on top of that, they've also had, they've had the, the good luck of having these exquisite water bodies, which are ponds. And as you know, these are really important carbon sinks. And when you have freak weather conditions or freak weather occurrences like storms, which is the kind of experience we have of climate change, is extreme storms out of the blue or extreme rainfall, then it is wetlands like that that act as sponges and absorb everything. And some years we have droughts, like two years ago. And then these, the water goes underground and you can use it. So they began covering all of it up and converting it into real estate. In fact, right now there's a court case um, that happened yesterday where they've taken this place which has 300 bird species, which is probably the richest site in the world of three acres with so many bird species, and they've decided to build on that. So they're trying to stop it. So I think they're multi on top of that, they're gated communities. So traditional sustainable practices you can't do. You can't have somebody to come in. Uh, we have a lot of people traditionally who come in and repair things for you. They'll repair your bed and they'll sharpen your knives. So you can keep reusing all your stuff. But all of them are now not allowed to come in because they're treated as um, you know, criminals who might make everybody insecure. And I, to me, visually, what I find very funny about this place is, um, is that, uh, you know, they have Gothic architecture, which is obviously a kind of neo, 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 neo Gothic, and all those kinds of things. And they have, uh, you know, they have houses, uh, they have buildings called uh, Orange County and Beverly Hills and all of that. So it's really surreal. You wonder what everyone was smoking when they were actually planning and naming all of this. But I think it's an example of a hugely unsustainable um, site and, uh, you know, really, what's it going to look like in 10 years? I think I find it interesting both what you just said about, about um, this is you were talking about, forgive me, I forgot the name already, I'm a terrible person, Good Al, and also Dubai. It's a form of almost sort of American cultural imperialism. This idea of the, the future city is always kind of the US car-based city, which is inherently pretty unsustainable. They just take up far too much space, and also they're all really boring. Like you can't, a city you can't walk around is not a city where you can kind of bump into interesting new experiences. So I suppose there is a question about how we kind of move past that vision of what the city looks like to something that looks a lot more European almost, I think. I think Paris is actually an excellent example of a, a city where the centre is built on a really nice human scale. So that's not really a question, I'm just kind of talking self-indulgently now. Um, we we, we should, we should probably be wrapping up. I was told to, to take a minute or two just to kind of uh, summarise very quickly at the end um, a couple of points that I personally have found very interesting in that debate. One of which is I obviously started talking about national failure, but I was sort of put in my place by being reminded about how much of this debate should actually be coming upwards from the community rather than downwards uh, from the state. We talked about small, that small cities versus large cities, how large cities perhaps you can get to scale when they have good PR on their side, but with small cities, change is often much easier to achieve. We talked about the need to talk about how we deal with these things so that th we're not just responding to a crisis, so that actually we're kind of getting ahead of the crisis and taking action first. Um, and and uh, the lady in the audience asked briefly about political instability um, in, a, in a small 
in a very different way, I found that quite a striking point because none of this is on the table back home as a topic of discussion because all we're talking about is Brexit and what the future of Britain is going to look like outside the European Union. So we're just going to get further and further behind the game, which is a very cheery note, a cheery self-indulgent note for me to end on there. But if I could ask you to put your hands together and thank all our panellists for their contributions this afternoon. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us in such a hot room. Yeah.